What's happening? Welcome to the Yannick Wisdala podcast. The bronchitis decided to take a hike and I felt good. I felt like a human for one whole day. Today's Monday. I felt good on Thursday. That was my one whole day of feeling better and not feeling wrecked. And then Thursday night, my daughter started feeling sick. And by Friday morning, I was totally sick again. I think this is a regular common or garden cold, something like that, but I'm all bunged up. At least I'm not hacking up a lung every 30 seconds. So that will be a welcome break for uh, regular listeners listeners to the podcast. Um, Very quick before we get started. The new book is out, Giant Steps book. If you don't have a copy, you can check it out. It's linked below in the description of this video if you're watching on YouTube. And it's linked in the show notes if you're listening elsewhere. I always forget to do that. And it's like 45 minutes in. I'm like, oh, yeah, should I have something new to share with the world? And I've totally left it, you know, way too late to where 70% of the audience has decided that it was dinner time or it's time to walk the dog and are not listening anymore. So that's that out of the way. And now I have a huge, massive uh, thanks to go out um, to Ralph, who was so unbelievably kind to send me over this mini disc player that he had. And um, I, I'd made a post on my Substack. That's my blog. If you're not on the mailing list, if you're not following the blog, that is also linked below in the show notes, in the description of the video. That's that's where I post about all this stuff on a really regular basis. It's free to read. It's where this podcast goes out. And I made a post about how kind of nostalgic I was about the old Sony uh, mini disc player. This is mine. This is my original one. It's broken. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for a really long time. You can see I still have the battery pack on the side. Um, the screen is cracked. I mean, this went through the wars, but this is what I used to tape all the bootlegs. I would go and see shows and, and, uh, and you know, bootleg all these amazing shows and listen endlessly to them and learn from them. Um, and uh, Ralph was so kind as to read that and say, hey, I have this one sitting here. I don't use it. I'd love, I'd be very happy to send it to you. And he sent me this the player and a bunch of blank mini discs as well. Like I, 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 I'm actually so nostalgic about the mini disc player that I wouldn't mind, you know, despite modern technology being what it is with the iPhone, I wouldn't actually mind traveling with it again and using it to listen to music on. Um, I am of course going to transfer all of these, um, mini discs. I've got dozens, uh, if not hundreds, I've been finding them in my storage and all over the place. And I found one, I'm going to play you a couple of things, which is really fun, uh, that I haven't heard in so, so, like literally in 20 years since my mini disc player stopped working. Um, but it, it, I found some mini discs and this one is May 12th, almost exactly 23 years ago, uh, at a regular gig I used to have in Boston at this huge restaurant called Marche. I don't know if anyone remembers this from those days back in Boston. Maybe it's even still there. Maybe it's even still a thing. Maybe it was a chain. I don't know. We just had a gig to play there. And it was basically all like cuisines from around the world, like tons and tons of different stations that made different food. You get prime rib over here. You get crepes over there. You could get seafood. It was just, you, you know, you went around and each station would stamp your card and you take your card at the end of the night and, uh, and they count up the stamps and that was, you know, they'd charge you appropriately. So part of our deal was we got to play the gig. I think I want to say it paid 300 bucks for the band. I think it was a $75 gig, which in on May, on May 12, 2000, I was what? 21 years old. And it was a regular gig. I think it was once a week or twice a month, something like that. It was fairly regular-ish. And um, on this one, <laughs> I have the band, uh, Marco Djordjevic playing drums, Milan Milanovic playing piano, and Bob Reynolds playing saxophone. And just finding all these mini discs and, and seeing, the, seeing the cases and seeing the set lists and the dates just brought it all kind of flooding back to me. Some, definitely some questionable song choices there. Here's one set from uh, May 12, 2000, uh, Shape of My Heart. I guess that's Sting. Uh, Red Baron, Billy Cobham, Mercy, 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 Cannonball, uh, Zaunel, uh, Caravan, Duke Ellington, and Shake Everything You Got, Maceo Parker. What a set list. Um, 
think the shake everything you got was probably my call because I was playing so much with Ken with Denard back then. I was playing in his band. I also found a mini disc, uh, February 16th, 1999. It says Woody and EP. Walter Smith gave me this nickname when, uh, when I was at Berkeley. Called me the English pimp, which got, you know, cut down to EP because I used to wear this chain. And I used to wear, uh, I mean, what's, you know, commonly known as a wife beater or a vest or a tank top or whatever when it was hot in the summer I'd wear this chain and uh, and this wife beater so he started calling me EP so that kind of stuck for a couple of years when I was living in Boston so this says Woody and EP uh, February 16 19, uh, 1999 I tell you what in February I was definitely not wearing a wife beater <clears throat> I was well bundled up in February it was freezing that year I remember it so well it was a brutal winter anyway I found so many of these gems. I found a live uh, Alan Holdsworth with Jimmy Johnson and Gary Husband live at Scholars, July 17th, 2000. Um, found so many of these gems. Bob Berg live, just all these amazing bootlegs that I, that I made, the concerts that I went to that I haven't been able to listen to in so long. So I'm getting back into that since this mini disc arrived from Ralph. Really, really appreciate that. That is like just above and beyond on the kindness scale. Um, so yeah, but one of the big ones was the, uh, it's the first time I saw Matt Garrison play live and it wasn't the first time I'd seen Schofield, but it's actually the only time I've seen Will Bulware, the organ player, keyboard player, and Marlon Browden, the drummer, play live. And I was really blown away. Like, of, of course, Matt was great and everything. And that was like, hee hee, here it is. Um, that was, that was great to see obviously live for the first time but the, the thing that really stuck with me was this guy Marlon Browden and his feel and his time and like his sound that has literally stuck with me for like as long as I mean that was probably I think that might even have been 98 so 25 years ago that has stuck with me and he's kind of hardly done anything since like I think maybe he lives in Germany now I'm not sure I doubt he'd ever be listening to this but if if, if he is if you are a massive fan Love the way you play, and uh, I'm so happy to have access to this bootleg again. And I'll play you a little bit. Mm. So just just that line, tiny things like that, like are popping out to me right now and thinking, oh yeah, I spent like four hours transcribing that and well, not four hours transcribing it, but 10 minutes transcribing it and then four hours playing that line in my you know, my apartment or in the practice room or something, this brings back really positive memories of the learning process and of what the experience of, well, the experience of just coming to America was like initially. Like that's very early on. I've like, you know, I've only been in the country like two or three months by then. That's, I think that show was before I went home for Christmas break. So I started in the fall of 98. So it would have been somewhere October, November, December, something like that in 98. I don't, I didn't actually write the date on the, on the, on the mini disc itself, unfortunately, but I remember it vividly. I remember I was there with my buddy Benno. Um, it was at the regatta bar. I remember sitting like off to the side. I remember exactly where I was sitting. I remember the sound, that low ceiling above the stage and, and how that affected the sound and the experience as a listener. I've, of course, since been back there to play uh, many times and I understand how that is from the stage now as well. So there's like, there are so many memories tied up in um, in things like this. <laughs> And the fact that you don't have to just like, it's not just like burning eighth notes or 16th notes. It's so quirky and funky and interactive the way Sko plays. I've always dug the way he did sort of the more electric kind of groove based thing. A go-go with Modesky Martin and Wood and then the Uber Jam band, especially with Adam Deitch. Um, always, always loved that. Um, and this, this kind of, they play one of the go-go tunes on here and uh, something I think they later recorded with the Uber Jam Band. I believe this was before the Uber Jam Band because I was also uh, ar around Berkeley and Boston at the same time as Adam Deitch and of course at school with Mark Kelly, the bass player who ended up being in the Uber Jam Band for a while. Um, <coughs> now, of course, the bass player for The Roots. 
<clears throat> so I think this was a band that never really, uh, I don't think it ever recorded an album. And it sort of fell between projects for Sko. Maybe somewhere between that like Quiet album and the Go-Go album, a Go-Go album. And between that and the, and the kind of U- Uber Jam band in the early 2000s. Um, but still such a smoking lineup. <laughs> And of course you hear there, there's no shortage of uh, amazing linear ideas in the 8th note uh, or 16th note, however you're subdividing the bar uh, department. You know, Sko Sko does all of that. He's um, a leading exponent of all of that, but it was the balance. I think that was one of the main things I got out of that experience of seeing one of those like real true masters live for the first time. I actually, again, Sko, this wasn't the first time I saw Sko. I know this because I vividly remember seeing Sko at the Royal Festival Hall in London, double bill with Michael Brecker Quartet. That must have been 97. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think it was Larry Grenadier and I want to say Bill Stewart with, with Sko. And that was The Quiet. I think the album was called Quiet. And that was that tour. And Mike Brecker was with Joey Calarazzo, James Genus. And I believe, I can't remember whether it was Tane or, um, oh man, why am I spacing on his name now? Whoa. One of my favorite bootlegs of all time is, wow, I can't believe I'm spacing on his name. Oh, this is really going to bug me. I've got to look it up. And it's only passed away, sadly, a couple of years ago. Uh... Oh man, how how on earth am I spacing on his name? It's going to come back to me as I get to the searching. I've got to Google this because it's really going to bother me. Um, Ralph Peterson, there we go. Didn't even have to... Whew, I'm not losing it. Yeah, Ralph Peterson. I think it, it was either Tane or Ralph. I know I saw them both. Maybe it was Tane that time and then I saw it with Ralph Peterson at the Barbican. Also with Joey Catarazzo and James Genus. Yeah, man, a lot of amazing shows back then. I remember seeing Chick Corea, the Time Warp Quartet. Um, and uh, I was like, oh, well, great, going to see Chick Corea and Bob Berg. And I knew that, that album, really specifically that album, I, I loved from, from any of the later acoustic piano recordings of Chick Corea, especially Gary Novak. That was huge for me, like the Paint the World electric band album and the, the, the quartet album the time warp album were just really massive for me because of Gary, uh, Gary Husband, because of Gary Novak in a big way. And the way the drums sounded on both of those records. Um, and then I remember going, I think that was the Barbican, maybe or the Royal Festival Hall, one of those big concert halls in London. And, uh, this was before I moved to the US. I didn't know anyone or anything. I'd just heard a few records and that was kind of it. And this was going to be my first time hearing John Patitucci live. So this must have been 97, I think. Before I went to the US, I think I was still at the Royal Academy of Music just. And, uh, and I was like, and then it was like an announcement. Yeah, Patitucci is not making the gig and it's James Genus. And I knew James from Return of the Brecker Brothers, you know, like 1992. The, the Live in Barcelona VHS, or that, that which I've talked about a lot in the past. And I remember being like, oh, shit, man, I was really bummed out. I wanted to see Patatucci live. Of course, James killed it. Um, and I'd never seen him live before either. So it was like, I ended up realizing uh, early on, like, hey, don't, don't like preconceive like what it's going to be like. You know, just because the thing that you wanted isn't happening, like keep an open mind about about what it might be because it was unbelievably great. What one of like definitely top ten concerts I've ever been to, and that you know, James Dean is a big part of that. So, um, yeah, that that taught me kind of early on, like okay, maybe your guy isn't there. I, it happened actually with Gary Novak, and I have the bootleg. That's actually one of the bootlegs I have. Uh, is Bob Berg at the Regatta Bar? That's January 20th, 1999. And that quartet was normally Ed Howard, Dave Kukoski, and Gary Novak. I saw that band so many times live. <coughs> I saw them in the UK also before I moved to the States. And um, 
Yeah, I went to the regatta bar and that was another last minute change. It was like, yeah, tonight Gary Novak's not going to be here. Uh, it's Adam Nussbaum instead. Um, so like it, definitely I was, of course, I'm a massive fan of Ed Howard and, and, and Kikoski, who I later got to play with and Bob Berg. And, and uh, you know, I, I was really going for that like face melting experience of, of, of seeing and hearing Gary Novak live. And uh, again, initially feeling a tinge of disappointment, like, oh shit, like this was the reason I was going there and he's not going to be on the gig. And then of course it's Adam Nussbaum, who was such a massive part of all the Michael Brecker, you know, quintet live bootlegs that I'd been listening to for so long. And, you know, the bootleg with Jacob Astorius at the, in New York with Steve Slagle and Hiram Bullock and, and Mike Stern. In fact, I don't think Hiram's on that. I think that's Stern, Slagle, and Jacko, and, and Nussbaum. And just, just awesome. Like, it ended up being such an awesome experience. And um, actually, I think, I think I went with Kendrick Scott to that. I think we, you can actually hear us talking. There's a phrase in there, like, after a drum solo or something. He's like, oh, yeah, dog, all of that loud shit like broke the mood after the bass solo. I said, there's some phrase I remember from that. So this, and again, I haven't heard that in more than 20 years. And this is, this is what I'm kind of psyched about with this uh, kind gift of the mini disc player from Ralph to, uh, to get back into that and to digitize it all and, uh, you know, transfer it into onto hard drives and be able to chop it up and share stuff, stuff, you know, share moments of that with you guys. Um, especially on the blog, I'll be, you know, putting songs here and there from sort of highlights of favorite moments over the years from the mini disc years. And it just took me like a massive walk down memory lane. So many of these Marche gigs with amazing bands, Jaleel, Jaleel Shaw, Walter Smith, Patrick Cornelius, Pete Zimmer, Milan Milanovic. I mean, some people who don't even play music anymore, but at the time, just the best really the best cats at, uh, at, at Berkeley. And I have old stuff with Tim Miller from 98, 99, when we were first playing together. So yeah, really, if you are, I would say this, if you are um, starting out, you're a younger musician and you have a smartphone, just always have it running. There's no, there's no substitute for the kind of inspiration it, it can possibly give you 25 years from now. If you're 18 listening to this podcast and you're going to rehearsals and you're going to live shows and you have all of this stuff going on musically in your life, record it, make a record of it and archive that shit. And it's so much easier these days. You, you'll you never be like in 25 years, you won't be like, Hey man, if there's anyone out there that's got an iPhone 14, I'm trying to recover these voice note files from, you know, 2023. Um, you won't have any of those problems in 2050. <clears throat> you'll probably just be able to think and have a brain triggered uh, playback system and just think about, oh yeah, I was at the dog and duck and I played this gig on a Wednesday, of, you know, November 2nd, uh, 2023, and it will just start playing in your head. Yeah, you won't have any of these mini disc situations that far in the future, I'm sure. But it is really amazing, A, how much you forget. Because, of course, I can't possibly retain all the information on these dozens and dozens and dozens of mini discs. Um, but it's amazing how important it has been to me over the past few days, listening back to some of this stuff and realizing some of the steps along the path uh, that I'd forgotten and really forgetting about how I got to where I am now and why I got to where I am now and some of the motivations for that back then. It's, it can be quite healthy to go back, at least it has been for me, to go back and listen to myself, uh, not just to myself, but to other things I was listening to, like the Schofield bootleg, for instance, at a time where I didn't have any pressure on, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't have any pressure on me and I didn't have responsibilities and I was right in the beginning and I also didn't have experience and didn't really have any concrete idea about what it was that I wanted to do or how I was going to go about doing it. I was just in it to be in it because I loved it kind of unconditionally. That was the, that was the mandate back then. And, uh, 
it'd be really, I mean, it'd be amazing just to be like that now, you know, not, I, I don't, I don't want to like strip myself of responsibility or anything like that. I'm quite happy to be where I am in terms of that. But in terms of the, like the mental approach to it, to just be like, like, <clears throat> feel like nothing matters, you know, and they feel like there are no consequences, feel like it doesn't matter what I do, something good is going to come out of it, which is generally how I think about things, for sure, like I do some really, on the face of it, you might look at it and go, holy shit, why the fuck did you ever think to do that, why are you doing this, why are you taking on this project, or why are you going in that direction, and normally it's just because I don't know, you know, and I'm happy not to know. I'm happy not to know what the outcome is going to be. I'm happy not to know all of the information I need to make the outcome be an outcome <laughs> and not just a dead end. And I'm really happy to learn what those things are along the way and absorb all that information to, uh, you know, essentially just become better at, at all of it and make, you know, better and more informed choices in the future. Um, so I guess having said the bronchitis has gone, which it has, I don't think the current decline in health is, uh, is really helping my cause and cause in terms of podcasting. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, now I want to decide how, uh, exposed I get here on the podcast <coughs> because I haven't vetted most of these bootlegs, uh, of my own playing and of my own band. Man, I've got rehearsals here from recording sessions, Brian McKnight bootleg, Michael Brecker bootleg with Tane, Matheny bootleg. What is this? Oh, these are songs. Oh, I used to get sent songs on mini discs to learn for touring. This is for, uh, also, I used to get sent songs on like cassette tapes and stuff and thought that the mini disc was way easier to carry around and was such an upgrade. So I've actually transferred a bunch of stuff to mini disc over the years. Uh, what do we have here? More Marche. I've got so many of these Marche gigs. That, that's good. I also have somewhere, it's, I have the box here, but not, I couldn't find the disc, um, is a trio gig with Hiram Bullock and Kenwood Denard. Uh, early 2000s. I've got the set list here written down. It's uh, Ode to Billy Joel, Teen Town, Invitation, Shake Everything You Got. Oh, I play solo and then we play Dolphin Dance and Little Wing. <laughs> that was kind of a typical Hiram Bullock set back then with that trio. I also have Bootleg of Us playing at the Blue Note in New York, early 2000s. That was after I moved to New York. Probably oh two maybe oh two oh three with Ayeto Moreira on, on uh, drums and percussion Flora Purim yeah it's um it's interesting I want to play you something that I'm gonna play you another bit of this uh Schofield bootleg where let's kind of skip around here a little bit where I think they're playing a tune from a go-go let's see Okay, uh, even that, even just the clapping, when I hear that on a live bootleg, I'm like, oh, yes. Immediately transported back to that moment, back to that place, back to the, the space and the, the sense of, um, I really have a sense of the room size and whether there was carpet or hardwood floor, what the seats felt like to sit on, like all of these sense memory things come back just from hearing the applause from the audience hopefully this fisherman's friend is going to help me out and uh let's see and i don't remember if there was a repeat or loop function on the mini disc but i have a very vivid memory of listening to certain songs just over and over and over again putting the headphones on getting into bed and like falling asleep listening to the same song over and over again Rare 
their bass melody on a Schofield tune. Oh yeah, I like this tune. And it was interesting how quickly some of these songs made it into like jam sessions at Berkeley. If there was more than like three or four of us that had been to this show, or any show for that matter, we'd all kind of have some some kind of common tunes that we were digging. And it'd kind of make it into our sort of jam session vocabulary pretty quick. Right there, that's like a masterclass in playing over a vamp. You know, just one chord, and, and all of those lines. Like that's sort of typical. Uh, that's, that's sort of typically what a lot of my practice routine would be centered around. We transcribing lines like that and figuring out how things work against a certain tonality, and then just changing the key and working on all those ideas in, in, in as many different contexts as I possibly could <clears throat> before taking smaller phrases and then moving them through tunes and changing the shape slightly, or rather changing the tonality slightly, but keeping the basic shape of an idea and moving it through sort of denser harmonic structures. Motivic development like that. One, two, oh, two, three, four, two, better, 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 better. Just, just two notes, right? It's just a two-note phrase, and hearing Sco move that around against the groove, massively important to my development as a as an improvising musician. And it really informed as I'm listening to that. It sort of really started to inform uh, the way I was approaching composition very very quickly um i remember spending a lot of time in the practice rooms with piano you know starting to write tunes and experimenting with vamps and moving harmony over the top of root notes and just trying to get a palette of sounds together of stuff that i liked and ended up sounding a lot like things i was listening to initially um and ripping little ideas off and phrases and uh you know chord sequences and stuff and but quickly getting away from it and just using like conceptually using some of those ideas in my own in my own framework and starting to even back then 19 20 years old starting to develop my voice as a writer and as an artist even though it was a few years before I put out my first record um that was really what was taking sh taking shape and that's what I hear in all of these mini discs and all of these bootlegs from back in the day you know, do I wish that this had been smartphone territory and I could just pull this up on my phone right now? Ah, maybe it would have made things a little easier to share it with you. But the nostalgia of going back into it all is is worth so much to me. And again, I can't recommend it enough. And no matter how you do it, <coughs> start arch archiving, start keeping the memories and start keeping all those reasons for what you for for why you do what you do keep them keep them not too far away you know especially if you ever have any doubt it's, you know i'm i'm a generally a pretty uh optimistic person when it comes to music and my career and i'm i'm positive about what i do and i really love what i do i'm always motivated to do it but i i definitely hit moments of doubt and moments of depression here and there and anything i 
confined to put me back in a in a more positive headspace uh, you know i'll take it and this is definitely one of those things um it's something i've tried to do you know at yannick's bass studio because i always have the gopro running um i always have you know i'm always archiving every single show i have that live archive up on the site and i'm always adding concerts to that you know and yeah okay it's a product and it's a part of yannick's bass studio and it's something <clears throat> it's something that's for sale and it's something people go buy. It's a, actually a source of income, but really the most fundamentally important part of it for me um, and the fact that I have to go through and chop the the shows up into songs and give them song titles and, and you know, archive the date and the location and the band members and all of that, that really the, the underlying thing is not about it being a product for sale, but it's about being able to go back and, you know, both ways, actually, I was going to say being able to go back to a place where I was doing something right or doing something that I liked or doing something in a time when I was inspired and getting re-inspired by that. But it's also going, being able to go back to a time where I was like, oh, maybe I'm having an issue right now. And then I have this distant memory of, oh, you know, I was in, I don't know, Melbourne, Australia or something. And I was playing that gig and that thing wasn't working out. And that thing's the same thing right now that isn't working out. So let me go back and look at that and look at what I'm doing now. And it's a... Uh, an amazing tool for finding solutions to problems <clears throat> that you might be encountering encountering in your day-to-day sort of process. So yeah, there's, uh, there's no downside to it. Uh, aside from the fact that with the video, you have to have a shitload of hard drive space. Um, and I like to shoot things in pretty decent quality. I don't use the GoPro in 4k. I think I have that set at 2k, but the files is still big. It's still 30, 40 gigabyte gigabytes of data per show. So that adds up. The archive kind of grows. <clears throat> and then when I render everything down and chop it up, maybe I'll do it in 1080p. And then I have playlists of all the all the um, songs we played and all the set lists. So, <coughs> yeah, well, it didn't last as long as I thought it was going to last. I'm going to call it, I think, there. That's uh, about as much as I'm going to get out without just going down the, the death spiral of coughing. Um but I'm glad to have been sort of back on schedule this week with the podcast and to be able to share a little bit of this with you. Much more to come on the blog. I will share tons more <clears throat> of these as I transfer them to the computer, as I categorize them and archive them. I'll be able to share things with you and, and, and more importantly, share stories ar- around them. It's not just about, hey, here's, a, here's an audio thing. It's really about the story and what I got out of it and why I was there or if it's a recording of me, you know, why I played a certain way. And then I'm sure I'm going to be exposed <laughs> by sharing some of these things. There are some really early gigs on these mini discs where, <clears throat> I mean, I sound like me, but it's pretty unrefined and rough around the edges. So it's a, that's an education, and just listening back to that. So uh, lots of that to come on a blog. Um, don't forget, again, the Giant Steps book is out now, Amazon and at my site, all linked uh, down below. And of course, our pre-sale is ever ongoing as we get closer and closer to going to Argentina to make the new record in August. Um, That's all linked below. Pre-sale is happening now. I am doing the bonus tracks that I talked about last week, uh, like the Japanese bonus tracks. There are going to be three extra songs on the album, but only for the people who... uh, who were involved in the pre-sale. I'm never going to release them to the public or stream them or anything like that. Those will be three exclusive tracks. For any of you uh, uh, fans, bass nerds, coffee drinkers, super fans, lovers of music, uh, supporters of the cause, that will be one of the many things, that is one of the many things we're adding to uh, anyone involved in the pre-sale. So go check that out. It's at yannickwasdala.com. It's all linked in the show notes or below. And uh, yeah, cough and health withstanding if it does next week i'll be uh, i'll be back with some more stuff and um kind of have a bit of a theme for next week's episode that i'm working on so i'm excited to uh, <clears throat> do some thinking about that and bring you uh, a little longer episode next week all right that's it see you later guys mm-hmm.